right, then we get started right now and we continue on with our work. The next subject I'd like to cover, and I know it's uppermost in your minds, is the coffee enemas. <coughs> I talked to some extent about coffee enemas already and the importance of the detoxifying and how specifically they help to detoxify the liver because they open the ducts so that the liver can release accumulated poisons, accumulated over years of wrong eating, of absorbing toxins, of getting them in the air, in the soil, in the water, in the food, and in all the substances, especially also drugs. And I'm not talking only street drugs, medical drugs, doctor drugs are all toxic. There are no drugs that the doctor prescribes that are not eventually liver toxic and that cause new disease. It does not exist. So you are toxic no matter which way to look at it. It's very important to get the toxins out of your system so the body can function. Okay? Now the enemas are relatively simple and the, uh, how to prepare them, it tells you exactly in the book. But uh, when you take the enemas, you want to lie on your right side. You want to relax with your legs gently drawn up, uh, curled up, comfortable. You don't want the enema bucket too high. You want it not more than about 18 inches above your body so the, the coffee doesn't go into the intestinal tract too rapidly and with too much pressure. The problem with that is that, you know, at all times there's peristalsis in the large intestine. And if you push too hard with counter pressure and peristalsis, you can get cramping. So you want to go let the coffee run in easy and gently. And if you feel discomfort, just stop the tube. Stop for a minute and let it pass. Okay? It should not be uncomfortable. It should certainly not be painful. It should be body temperature and relaxing and easing. And generally, uh, the patient should retain the enema for up to 12 minutes. If they can't, okay. If they cramp, okay. After a little while, as the intestinal tract is cleared and a lot of the accumulated toxins are moved out, all of this is much easier. But we don't want you to cramp yourself, to tighten yourself, to frighten yourself, and uh, then you say, well, it didn't work, I couldn't hold it. Of course it works. So if you hold it three minutes or five or seven minutes, okay. Don't panic. Everything works out after a little while. Okay. <coughs> uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting. We have so many jokes about coffee enemas, of course, uh, and some of the detractors say, what do you mean? You mean with sugar and cream, you know? Uh, but we had a very funny one. One of our patients had a, a little boy about two years old when he had brain tumor and he had uh, uh, other cancer, also metastases in the lungs, and he started on the Gerson therapy. So the kid grew up with his father in, on the Gerson therapy and, of course, regularly taking coffee enemas. And the father recovered, was in good health by the time kid was about five one day. The father and the, uh, takes the boy along to a meeting he was attending. And the boy looks around after the meeting, after the talk, and he comes up to his dad. And he, he says, hey, dad, these people are drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Now, these enemas are extremely important and help to detoxify. It is a mistake to start the juices, to drink a number of juices, and not do the coffee. Because the juices begin to force the chemicals out of the cell systems. They, the enzymes and the nutrients enter the cells and tissues and they release, the tissues and cells release accumulated poisons into the bloodstream. And now you must help the liver to get rid of these. If you don't, you get headaches, you get sicker than you were before, you damage the liver. Okay, so you can't do half of the equation, you've got to do the other half. As you force the chemicals out, you've got to help them for the, uh, the body to release them, or else they damage your liver. You don't want to do that. It also works the other way around. 
Uh, I think I mentioned earlier at the Gerson Therapy Hospital in the beginning when the patients are so toxic uh, and we force all these nutrients in and release the poisons, we give up to five enemas a day. But you can't do five enemas if you don't do the juices because the juices have to replace the minerals. Some of those get washed out with the enemas and the fluids have to be replaced. So it's very important that you remember that the therapy is not juices alone or just the diet alone. It is a complex, total approach to all the body systems. You've got to do the right juices, you've got to do the right food, you've got to do the enemas, you've got to do the supplements. Everything has to be fitted into the whole biochemical complex, which is the human body and which the therapy deals with. Okay, so we want to be very careful. Now, on top of the coffee enemas, Dr. Gerson found that people are so toxic nowadays that he did have to do some additional, still more intensive detoxifying. He gives the patient every other day two tablespoons of castor oil and five and a half hours later a castor oil coffee soap enema. Now that really releases such accumulated poisons that you can't believe. And some patients will tell you that castor oil is abrasive. It, it burns. Well, castor oil doesn't burn. No oil burns. What's burning is the chemicals that are released by your liver, by your body, that the body gets rid of, and now you can function and breathe, and the pain goes away. And the castor oil is a very important part of helping not just to clear the lower intestinal tract, not just for the liver to release the toxins, but there are also toxins in the entire small intestine. Hey, between the liver and the large intestine, there's 30 foot of small intestine winding around. And then before from it was released from the large intestine through the anus, there's another three and a half or four foot of large intestine that all of this has to go through. So the castor oil brings it all out much more rapidly and much more thoroughly and completely. And that's in a very important part of the Gerson therapy. Now, there's some very important alterations that we have to make. Occasionally, people have uh, diarrheas and chronic uh, colitis and so on and so forth. Well, we don't give them that heavy coffee enemas. The coffee, in that case, is soothed and smoothed by being mixed partly with chamomile tea, which is soothing to the intestinal tract. And sometimes instead of three or four or five coffee enemas, we do maybe two chamomile tea and one coffee to make it soothing and to help the intestinal tract first to recover before we get all these toxins released from the liver. So some of these things have to be adjusted, and that's what we have doctors for, who have learned and know how to deal with these problems. Another very serious problem is chemotherapy. The chemotherapy poisons are released only partially. Approximately 50% of what they pump into the patient is released and comes out of the system. What about the other 50%? That remains, and we don't know where it is, but we know it remains in the body. And we also know that if we now do very intensive detoxifying, such as including the castor oil, we have to go more easy because the castor oil forces these chemicals out of wherever they are hiding so rapidly that that chemotherapy is all released at once into the body and the patients can get a tremendous overdose. Let me explain. Let's say a patient has had uh, 10 chemotherapy treatments, of which five remain in the body. We now give very rapid, intensive detoxifying, and all these five chemos come out of the cell tissues, wherever they're hiding, into the bloodstream, into the liver, all at once. Now, five treatments is an overdose, isn't it? The doctors don't give you five treatments at once. It's a huge overdose. And we have found the hard way that that can cause tremendous danger and trouble. 
Twice patients ended in intensive care after chemo with the castor oil. So we've cut out, at least for the time being, the castor oil for chemo patients. Because now we have to detoxify them more gently, more slowly, so that all these chemo treatments don't hit them at the same time. Slowly, they detoxify. It is more difficult to deal with such patients. They've had additional poisons pumped into their system. They have more damage done. It's a bone marrow damage. It's immune system damage. The kidneys are damaged. The liver is damaged. All of this caused by the chemo. And it is harder to rebuild. So we are always very grateful when the patients have not had any or very little. It's better a little than a lot. It's still bad, but it's better. Each chemo treatment they didn't get, we're grateful for. Much easier to deal with, OK? So the chemo patients are not put on as drastic and as dramatic and intensive a therapy. They get a less intensive treatment. No castor oil. They get less uh, potassium and enzymes and thyroid than the other patients, OK? So this is very important for anybody who wants to do the therapy at home after chemo treatment. They has to be very cautious because of this intensive detoxifying. Another thing we do with chemo patients, we give them a little vitamin C. The vitamin C helps to neutralize some of these chemicals. Non-chemo patients do not get vitamin C. There's very adequate vitamin C in all the fresh fruits and vegetables and juices. And giving vitamin C under those circumstances, according to Dr. Freeman Cope, who was MD as well as a PhD in biochemistry, is not a good idea because vitamin C can be an enzyme inhibitor. It's a, uh, <coughs> it's a, uh, not an activator, but it's a, uh, um, let's see, it's a detoxifying agent, but it's not an oxidizer. It's a reducing agent. And we do need to oxidize. And uh, the cancer cells die with oxidation. So giving a lot of vitamin C is unwise. We do not use vitamin C in our regular patients, only chemo patients. So there are some adjustments that have to be made. Then we also make adjustments, for instance, in uh, diabetic patients. We had a very interesting patient who came to us, 300 pounds. Uh, he not only was very young, 46 years old, at 38 years of age, he had already had a massive heart attack, uh, partly because of his overweight. He was left, of course, with high blood pressure, with heart damage, with very severe diabetes, and uh, he was uncontrolled with insulin, with drugs. His blood sugar ran 240 to 400. You may know that it shouldn't run much over 100, 110, 120. That's about the maximum. But his glucose was running to up to 400 with drugs. So uh, he had a lot of problems. He was also on gout medication. Now, what is gout? Gout is caused by the inability of the body to properly digest and eliminate proteins. So what happens, some of the intermediate end products of protein digestion, the uric acid, is not properly excreted. So it rises in the blood. And when uric acid rises too much, it finally falls out in crystals. And the uric acid crystals are tiny, tiny little a needle-like crystals that love to go into the, uh, into the cartilage and the uh, joints. So they raise all kinds of heck in the joints. Naturally, the answer is cut out the proteins. But that's not what orthodox medicine does. They give you a drug to reduce, uh, to reduce the gout problem. But what happens, the drug is kidney damaging. So we've seen a gout patient who'd had gout for many years, who was given the gout medication and ended up with kidney cancer. Now this patient with all these problems also had gout and was getting gout medication. And if he didn't take it one day, he'd have a terrible attack. 
Well, he came to us being a diabetic and being tremendously overweight and so on, and yet we gave him the juices. Now, we cut down a little bit on the carrot juice because that's higher in sugar. We gave him more of the green juices. Uh, we gave him nowhere near as much thyroid. He wasn't a cancer patient. He got very little thyroid. And we had to deal with this very gingerly, very cautiously. And we did make one other adjustment because of this tremendous uh, diabetic problem. Uh, we gave him a glucose tolerance factor, a chromium picolinate, uh, 200 micrograms uh, twice a day. Now, this man drinking 13 glasses of juice a day, plus having the three full vegetarian Gerson meals, lost a pound a day. Furthermore, within five weeks, the uncontrolled diabetes was gone, and his blood sugar without further drugs was 105, without insulin. Furthermore, from the first day on the Gerson therapy, he cut off the gout medication. We don't give any proteins, any animal proteins which cause the problems. The, the vegetarian proteins are not difficult to digest, cause no problem. From the first day he was off the gout medication, no further gout attack. By the time five weeks were up, his blood sugar was normal, he had lost 35 pounds, and he was at the clinic about two and a half months. By that time, he had lost very close to, two, to 100 pounds. He was now down to a very manageable 200. He was six foot two, so 200 he could carry. He was a little bit chubby, but he could carry fairly normally. His heart was better. His blood pressure was getting toward normal. His diabetes was cleared. His weight was under control. Everything was going away like it was supposed to. The gout, of course, was gone. Now comes the real kicker to the story. This man was the son of one of our long-term recovered pancreas cancer patients. His father came to us eight years ago, seven years earlier before he started the treatment, seven years with advanced pancreas cancer, he was given three months to live. He had had the father, three heart attacks. He had arthritis. And he was on the therapy, and he recovered. And the son, seeing this, knowing about it, lets himself get into this kind of condition where he was this close to death, with his uncontrolled diabetes, heart problem, and this enormous obesity. Now, that's discouraging. That's rather scary, that people really let themselves get to that point where that close to death, when they know what can be done and how it should be done. That's right. Okay? Just to give you an idea, though, of the tremendous complications that we can and do deal with, but you see, this kind of a patient, I would discourage from trying to do the Gerson therapy at home. We had to do a lot of adjustment and a lot of, you know, specific things for his specific problems, all right? Of course he got the castor oil enemas, of course he got the various coffee enemas and all the other things, and he got the juices including the, uh, the carrot juice, which is relatively sweet in spite of the diabetic problem. The diabetes is not a problem of sugar. It's a problem of cholesterol. Blockage of the insulin receptors in the cell, the cholesterol. Now, there is such a thing as juvenile diabetes. Now, juvenile diabetes is a different thing altogether. Juvenile diabetes is usually the result of a poorly functioning immune system. And when children have constant colds and flus and pneumonias and more flus and more colds and constantly go to the doctor and the doctor constantly gives them more antibiotics and still more antibiotics, their immune systems are down and are further down and still more because these antibiotics are toxic. So after a while then, they finally have a flu they can't shake. Finally, five, six, seven weeks later, they're a little better, 
and now they're diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. Now that flu was not a flu. That was a pancreatitis. Now the pancreas is truly damaged with the pancreatitis. And there is true damage to the islands of Langerhan, so there is a reduced insulin production. We can help those patients too. But the first thing is to prevent this kind of nonsense. And how do you prevent it? When a kid has a pneumonia, you say, no, no, we won't give you antibiotics. No, you don't want to do that. You don't want to let the child die. Once the child is dead, you can't help him, right? You want to get rid of the infection. You want to get rid of the pneumonia. And OK, you give antibiotics, but you don't stop there. And that's the key. After the severe uh, acute problem is cleared, now you build up the kid. You detoxify. You build up his immune system. You give him lots of carrot juice and lots of fresh raw apples and carrots grated and lots of fresh salads and lots of fresh vegetables. And you cut out the garbage. You cut out the ice cream and the Cokes and the Frankfurters and hamburgers and the french fries and the cookies and the cakes and so on. And you build them up. If you don't, you risk all kinds of new problems later. It can't be done. You've got to build up. When kids already have a bunch of infections, clearly they have a damaged immune system, clearly you've got to do something. And if you don't do it, then you get either the juvenile diabetes, it's a terrible disease. It's not something to joke about. Or you get more serious problems, including leukemias and cancers. Very, very serious. Or preventable, totally preventable. And I have a problem with prevention. It's one of the most difficult things to get people to do. I had a man who was an ophthalmologist, and he wanted me to do a lecture for in Oklahoma City. And he also had a newspaper column, which he published regularly. He was very excited. He rented a 1,200-seat auditorium. And in his column, he talked all about my coming and the lectures and the preventing cancer and so on. And I looked at those columns. I said, we're not going to have anybody coming. I said, why? But I put a lot of advertising and all this. I said, but you stress prevention. People aren't interested in prevention. A few of you, maybe. But then I asked him. I said, look here. You are now suffering of diabetes. You've had diabetes for six years. He said, yes. Then I said, look, say eight years ago, before you had any problem, eight years ago, Somebody wanted you to come to a lecture, a very important lecture, on how to prevent diabetes. Would you have gone? He said, no. And that's the answer. Until you have a problem, until you have real serious problems, you want to take a pill and you go to the doctor and you want to take a little spray and you want to take a shot of this and that and you don't want to go in your merry way, you don't want to know anything about changing your lifestyle. Now, is it different here? The people that are here are probably different, or they wouldn't be here. But that is the most, the average, the common thing. People don't want to be bothered. And usually a pill or a shot, or you know, have a headache, you'll take uh, two Advil's or two Tylenol's or something like that. Or you have a constipation, so you take a laxative. Or something like that, you don't want to be bothered with changing your lifestyle and help them to build and clean and clear and heal your body. But it's got to be done. It has to be done. Now, when these people now have the enemas and the juices, and they begin to kick in, that body begins to work, the immune system starts to kick in, and the body's functions begin to work, then we have a flare-up, a healing reaction. It's described in the book, on page 201. The immune system starts to work. And in some patients, we get fevers. OK? Now, when the doctor sees a fever, what does he do? Ah, oh, there, there, you poor thing. Here's a shot. We'll get rid of the fever. No way. We don't want to do that. A fever is usually very beneficial. A fever helps the body kill and get rid of tumor tissue. A fever is the good thing. <coughs> It means the immune system is starting to work. And we don't want to stop it. We help the body. 
We help with extra juices, with extra fluids if necessary, with extra enemas to help to get rid of the junk that is now being cleared out of the system. In some cases, we get nausea. Dr. Gerson describes in some cases spasms, all kinds of possible things when the body clears a lot of the junk out of the system. And then comes something very interesting. Patients get aches and pains as though you had flu, and they feel depressed and miserable because they're full of these toxins, but they look wonderful. Their, if their circulation is improved. Their blood picture is improved. Actually, their body on their face reflects healing, and inside there's a war. But when they look well like that, and they describe the healing symptoms of the healing reactions, we know they're healing. And this is another problem if you try to do the therapy at home. You can feel terrible. You can have aches and pains and fever, and you've never been so sick, and you say, oh, this therapy is not for me, I feel terrible. It's not doing anything, I just feel worse than I've ever felt before. And you quit, and that's when you are lost. Because as you quit, you're not going to go back to the therapy, and then you're going to die. If you're really seriously ill, particularly with cancer. Just as your body is beginning to respond and doing the right things because you don't understand what's happening, because you haven't understood the book, you're not under medical supervision, you have nobody helping and encouraging you as we would at the hospital, you give up. You say, this doesn't agree with me, it's no good for me. When it's just starting to work and doing the right thing. That's a real, real dangerous period to get over. And you have to understand it, and you have to know what you're doing, and you have to respond correctly. It's described in the book what to do. But it's a dangerous cliff to pass. Now, when you pass it, then you see the tumors reduce. When you get better, now you feel better. Now you get better appetite. Now your immune system is working. Your skin begins to clear. Your tumors begin to come down. Now you get the effect if you stay with it. If you give up at this point, you're finished. Okay? Very, very serious, dangerous situation. Okay? How long does a down period last? It's not a down period. It feels maybe like it is. It doesn't. It depends on exactly how sick the person is. The most seriously ill, it lasts the shortest because they haven't got the energy and the strength yet to really fight. So it can be maybe just six or eight or ten hours. In most cases, it lasts a day and a half or two. In some cases, when the patients are not too seriously ill, it can last two or three days or more. Okay? But they need to understand what's happening, and they need to realize that it's positive, not down, but a positive response. Okay? Is the coffee castor oil? Yes, absolutely. The enema and the whole treatment is covered in the book. Okay, now I want to quickly go on because we have a lot more to cover. The next discussion, I want to uh, help you understand the medication. The exact medications that are given are uh, to each patient are, first of all, outlined by Dr. Gerson. He made a chart, and it's on page 235. And it gives you not only the exact chart for medication that he used and how he used them and how he altered them a little bit from time to time as the patient got better, <coughs> but on the next page, 236, we have broken this down. The first line, the first intensive treatment is broken down into hourly times and things to do. The juice in each hour, what medication comes in each hour, and so on. Then the following pages show you how these medications are changed with, as time changes as, uh, as you go. How, <coughs> the, you know, you take a little more, you take a little less, this is in in increased, this is decreased, and so on. But the basic medications, the ones we use, are outlined and described on page 246, on the right-hand page. 
And I'd like to go over that and give you a little understanding of what medications there are and why they are used. The top one is thyroid, and right after that is Lugo. Those two go together. <coughs> I've already mentioned that a very important part of the whole body structure and the defense system and the immune system is the thyroid. The thyroid is a gland that regulates metabolism. Also body heat, temperature, also the immune system. Everything hangs on this thyroid. And the thyroid has to function. In order to function properly and adequately, it requires iodine. And many of our soils are deficient in iodine. Now, the US government knew this way back in the 30s, that there are certain parts in the United States, they're called the goiter belts, where people were deficient, the soil was deficient in iodine, and people were deficient and were growing goiters. So the US government very nicely decided they would medicate the entire population with iodine. By doing what? Iodizing salt. And they assume that everybody eats salt. Therefore, if there's iodine in salt, you get the iodine that you need. Great and fine, but salt is a poison. Salt is an enzyme inhibitor, and enzyme inhibitors are also defined as poisons. So if you take your salt to get your iodine, you get your iodine, but you get poison along with it. So since we must cut out salt, and salt specifically stimulates mitosis. What's mitosis? Cell division. In order to get fast cell division on cancer, you have to have salt. So salt stimulates tumor growth. So obviously we have to cut out salt but we still need iodine. So the thyroid, in order to activate the thyroid gland, the immune system, the burning of the fats, and the activation of the response, the immune response, we need a little thyroid gland, plus we need iodine to give the thyroid the nutrient it needs, namely iodine, because we can't use salt. Okay, so the, the Lugo solution is iodine. Okay, next after that comes potassium. And that's certainly also one of the most, item, most uh, important single items. The potassium compound, Dr. Gerson made more than 300 experiments before he arrived at this combination. And I have heard, <coughs> again, Dr. Freeman Cope stating that it is absolutely a genial combination. Uh, for various reasons I can't go into, it's too extensive. But the combination of potassium gluconate, potassium acetate, and potassium phosphate in equal parts to make a 10% potassium compound solution helps to get the potassium back into the cells. With the potassium, we suppress the rapid cell division, the mitosis, which is the cancer. We improve the uh, the differentiation of the cell, the normal healthy cells, so that these active, useless tumor cells can't grow. We need the potassium. Potassium activates enzyme system, the oxidation, so the tumors can't grow. All of it works in the right direction, as well as it helps activate enzymes to break down and digest and get rid of atherosclerosis and plaque and high blood pressure and heart disease also to restore tissues that are sick and damaged, like in asthma and in other uh, uh, problems where the uh, tissue damage, uh, the mucous membranes are dried out and allergic and are not functioning, etc. Potassium is needed for all these functions, as well as, as I said earlier, for normal muscle function. And if there's not adequate muscle function, you get cramping. And you get leg cramps, and you get cramping intestinally, and so on. You get spasming, and it causes glaucoma, etc. Potassium is essential in all of these problems. And I repeat, Dr. Gerson said, the beginning of all chronic disease is loss of potassium from the cell systems. We've got to get the potassium back into the cells. So we give an awful lot, a tremendously high amount of potassium. And now comes the important thing. 
this potassium compound, this 10% compound solution, the beginning patients in the, the first few weeks, they get in their 13 glasses of juice a total of 40 teaspoons of the 10% potassium compound. Very, very high amount. And now the doctors scream and yell and say, it's going to give you a heart attack, it causes heart fibrillation, it's going to kill you, it's going to kill you, it's going to kill you. I am happy to report that nobody has ever died of the potassium. I have personally taken it for well over 50 years. The answer is quite simple. Every doctor and nurse, usually in medical school or in their training, is shown an animal that is given a high doses of not potassium gluconate acetate phosphate, but potassium chloride. And those animals go into fibrillation, and if it isn't stopped, they die. And it's all because of the potassium, right? Wrong. It's partly, largely because of the chloride. This doesn't happen with regular potassium, the way Dr. Gerson put it together, okay? There's another thing, too. The body has a very powerful mechanism of getting rid of excess potassium, namely the kidneys. And unless your kidneys are severely ill, you're not going to get an excess of potassium under any circumstances. Now, we have some proof of that. When we first started the hospital going in Mexico, we were helping the patients to understand what was going on, and we showed them about the potassium compound, and they got the salts, the potassium salts, 100 grams, in a little container, and in order to give them enough of their medication to take home, we couldn't give them 12 or 15 quarts of potassium water, and mainly water, you know, 10% uh, solution, so 90% water, but carrying all of that would have been dangerous and could have broken and would, you know, foolish. So we gave them the potassium compound in the, just the solids and we carefully explained to them and in red on the label marked it saying dissolve in one quart of water to make the 10% solution. Dissolve entire contents in one quart of water and take as directed. So I got a phone call. And a lady calls me and says, hey, you know, I left the clinic a little over three weeks ago, and I was supposed to have three months' worth of medication, and here I'm already out of potassium. I knew right away what she had done. I also knew about these propaganda about the potassium causing heart fibrillation and death in animals that the doctors learn. So my first question was, well, how do you feel? I knew what she had done. She says, oh, I haven't felt better in my life. Good. And I said, look, have you got that little bottle of potassium compound in front of you? She said, yes, she says, yeah, I have it right here. I said, would you be good enough and read me the label? She says, oh, the label says, dissolve entire contents in one quart of water. I said, did you do that? She said, no, I took it straight. <laughs> So this enormous dose of potassium that we're already giving, she took a 10 times overdose because she didn't have a 10% solution. She took it 100%. And she was fine. No problem. Okay. Unfortunately, no matter how often you tell people and how much you teach them, they will still make mistakes. And this hasn't happened once. It has happened several times. Other patients have done the same thing and have taken this huge overdose of potassium, and nothing untoward has ever happened. No danger. Don't let doctors tell you it'll kill you. It will not. Unless you have very severe kidney damage, there is no problem. Okay? So, you please, you can take this potassium, properly diluted, we don't believe in overdosing, properly diluted, you can take it as described in the book. Okay? Now, the next item is a liver injection. The crude liver extract is extremely important to help rebuild the sick, damaged livers. We work very hard on the liver, so we also give liver extract and B12 to also help the cancer patient to rebuild bone marrow and rebuild blood. Because it's very interesting. I've seen it under the black microscope. Uh, You can see 
the tumor tissue ingesting, eating red blood cells. They thrive on them. They eat them up. So it's not at all unusual for cancer patients to be anemic. So we also work with the B12 and the crude liver extract to help the anemia, to help the bone marrow, help the liver. We work with all the organ systems, all of which are damaged before you can even have cancer, okay? We also have the next item, fresh cow's liver juice has, have, has had to be discontinued. The animals have an epidemic of uh, infections and we've had to discontinue it. It doesn't make a big difference though because we get all organic food, we are giving capsules of the uh, liver powder and we are having excellent results. The therapy continues to work as is. We give niacin. Next item is niacin, 50 milligrams. Uh, we give six times a day. Niacin does two things. Niacin helps to open capillaries, helps to bring the freshly oxygenated blood back into the system, into the tumor tissue, which can stand the oxygenation and dies. But niacin also helps in the protein digestion. What protein digestion? You're only getting vegetarian protein. What protein digestion? Tumor tissue is protein. You've got to digest this protein. It's got to be broken down. But not only tumor tissue, uh, arthritic tissue, lumps and bumps and all of these tissues. Also, we are able to dissolve uh, kidney stones and gallstones and so on. All of this can be done with the red, right enzymes opening capillaries and getting the digestion in function, in shape. Okay, so niacin ho helps in two ways, opens capillaries, improves circulation, cold feet, blue toes, all of this goes away, everything turns nice and pink, the feet are warm again, hands, fingertips are warm again, and circulation is vastly improved. The next item is acid or pepsin. That is stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, plus pepsin. It's a well-known fact, uh, well accepted, that in most chronic disease patients, they're lacking stomach acid. So we supply it in the form of the acid or the hydrochloric acid. Plus, we give pepsin, which is also a digestive enzyme. They, we just help the whole digestive system. We help to digest the tumor tissue or other, other disease tissue. We help to break down old scar tissue. We are even able to overcome um, people's uh, uh, epilepsy, which is scar tissue in the brain, and that sort of thing. All of that can be done. That's part of it, giving the digestive enzymes like acid or pepsin, and further down at the bottom of the page, the pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic enzymes are active by themselves to break down tumor tissue. But given in the proper combination on this therapy, they break down and digest tumor tissue. In most people, they, if they have adequate pancreatic enzymes, they could not develop cancer. Because the pancreatic enzymes recognize and digest malignant tissue as foreign tissue. So why do people have cancer? because they eat so much meat and animal proteins that the pancreatic enzymes are all used up in the digestion of foods and there's nothing left over to protect you. So if you'd only stop eating meat and animal products, you're almost certain not to develop cancer. Now, wait a minute, I want to make very clear. There are some people who tell me, oh yeah, but I'm a vegetarian, how come I got cancer? I said you were drinking milk. Yeah, I drank a lot of milk and I ate cheese. Well, that's animal protein. You were using up your pancreatic enzymes in the digestion of milk and cheese. Then I get people telling me, no, I wasn't taking any milk or cheese. I said, well, wait a minute. Are you married? No. Well, you must have eaten a lot of uh, pasta and canned tomato sauce. Yeah, I live on that. So I said, well, what kind of nutrients are in there? What kind of nutrients is in pasta? It's white flour. 
there's nothing in there. But where's the vitamins, the minerals, the enzymes? Nothing. And canned tomato sauce is dead. It's canned. It's cooked to death and, and, and kept. It won't spoil because there's nothing left in it to spoil. So if you insist on eating dead and rotten and preserved foods, you can't get well or be well, even if you are vegetarian. Vegetarian alone doesn't prove anything. You've got to know what you're doing. Vegetarian, organic, live foods is what we are talking about. Not dead, denatured, processed, useless junk. Okay? Okay, so the enzymes are important to help the digestive system, to help assimilate. So we give not only the digestive juices, the acids, the, the acidol, but we also give pepsin and pancreatic enzymes. Very, very important. Uh, then you'll also see on there an item marked lubile. That's an, a bile powder, an ox bile powder, which we use in combination with the castor oil to make the castor oil enema. That's already pretty uh, sophisticated. The 10% solution of caffeine, potassium, citrate is almost unobtainable. But coffee takes its place. The coffee does the job. So forget it, you don't need it, just use the regular coffee as in coffee enemas. Then there's one other item marked linseed oil, and that is flaxseed oil, and I covered that at length. And that covers the medication page. Questions? All right. How much thyroid are we talking about? How much thyroid are we talking about? It's exactly outlined on page 235. How much thyroid is given? We start. I've been, I uh, had a thyroidectomy, had a small portion left. I had really bad side effects from the thyroid. And when they took me off of it, I was fine. I've been fine ever since. For All right. 15, 20 years. Yeah, but well then, as a question, you have cancer. No. No. Well, then, that's a whole different story. We use a certain amount of thyroid, and Dr. Gerson explained why the thyroid is so important in order to help activate the immune system and the whole metabolism and the burning. If you don't have that problem, then you don't need to take any more. You're probably in balance. That's fine. Now, for the cancer patient, in the beginning, if they've not had chemotherapy, we give five grains of thyroid a day for the first two to four weeks. That's reduced to two and a half. Plus, we give Lugo. That's all outlined on this page, OK? Are there other questions? Is there any of this that one would use for prevention? Is there any of this one would use for prevention? Then you would go to the back of the book, Appendix 1, which tells you uh, what to do for an, a less intensive therapy for non-malignant disease. Now, if you still make this less intensive, then you have a good preventive diet. Okay? Uh, I, I think why does Paul mention that increased pregnancy is, is good for cancer? Why does he have that? Vitamin C helps to detoxify the body. And in his case, his vitamin C patient, given large amounts, did well for a number of weeks, a number of months, but eventually died. Because he was able to detoxify them for a period of time. But eventually the body breaks down. There is no one vitamin that will cure cancer. I don't think it's cure I know, it doesn't. Okay. What about injections of vitamin C? What about them? What about injections of vitamin C? You can inject more than you can take orally, that's true. And what do you ex expect to what do you expect to achieve? Well on this um Okay, uh, injecting high amounts of vitamin C can be very helpful, especially in infections. It does help to control infections. Who? Oh, yeah, he had cancer. Okay, there are various things, infections and so on, that can be helped with vitamin C, but you cannot deal with vitamin C alone and help to cure cancer. We are talking about curing chronic disease. I understand. 
certain chronic disease, you can... Collagen. Collagen disease, okay. Vitamin C can be helpful in those areas, but vitamin C is still a reducing agent, and we have to do oxidizing. And vitamin C reduces oxidation. It does not work together. In some cases, especially in infections, it can be very helpful, okay? But basically, it doesn't restore and heal the organ systems. Yes? <laughs> That's what we're talking about, okay? This lady says that Norman Cousins' wife bought organic food and they got a good, pure diet because the vitamin C alone is not a cure. There is no, except very specific vitamin deficiencies that can be cured with vitamins. Like scurvy, you get vitamin C, and like uh, beriberi for B deficiency, and so on. Other than that, you cannot cure disease with one substance. You have to get to all the underlying systems. You have to deal with the body as a whole metabolic unit, and you cannot deal with one substance for curing. Okay? I wouldn't even say that potassium alone cures anything. Okay? Very important. And even, even uh, Linus Pauling doesn't say vitamin C cures cancer. Well, it's a positive thing. You can never change it orally enough. I understand that. There's no point to argue about it. There are certain items, if you take a certain amount of vitamin C, your colon uh, rebels, and it has a so-called, uh, um, <laughs> what's it called? Um, a tolerance factor, okay? You can, some people can take 15, 20, 25 grams of vitamin C. Others begin to get violent diarrhea at 10, 12 grams. So they can't give it by mouth in those large amounts. And they can get some good symptomatic relief temporarily. But you've got to follow it up with healing. It is not enough, I assure you. And this lady confirms it, okay? All right. Do we have other questions on the medication? Yes? Um, I'm taking radiation, which I don't like to take. For what reason? Well, because I had cancer, cancer and um, I've been out of the hospital maybe uh, a month. Um, should I put the radiation? I mean, what does it do to your body? And, uh, well, why are people afraid of radiation? Why do people get sick in Chernobyl in that area? What does radiation do? Ionizing, it damages the tissues, it, uh, it causes a shriveling of the tissue. It yeah, does, in some, it, in some cases, for instance, for cancer, it, it shrivels up the capillary so the cancer doesn't get any nutrients. So when it sits beyond there, it dies. But in the course of doing the radiation, you do damage to other tissues, to your immune system. And therefore, it can come back in other ways. It is not healing. It's supposed to burn some of the tissue or kill some of the tissue. Okay? I'm not going to tell you to stop radiation. You can only do that if you do enough other things to clear your cancer. Okay? All right. Now we can go on to the next item. Very, very important. If you really want to heal, you need to do two things. I have to get back to that. Detoxify and rebuild the body. Because all disease is toxicity and deficiency. So you want to relieve those two items. Which means you have to avoid toxins. Now, one of the most toxic places is your home. In the home, you have chlorine. Very bad, very damaging. I talked about that, the thyroid. In your home, you have solvents. You spray furniture polish, you have shoe polish, you have other solvents, even benzene solvents and per turpentine, all of which toxic. In the home, you got aerosols. They are, uh, high, uh, they are fluorocarbons, very toxic. Don't use them. Uh, if you have even things like Windex, it's not aerosol, but it's sprayed into the air. It's evaporated, and you get the vapor. They're vaporizers. You get the vapor. You inhale it, it goes into your body. 
These things don't belong into your body. Uh, you want to be very careful with these. But worse than that, for instance, is new carpeting. We've had terribly sick people because of new carpeting. The outgas, they're very dangerous. Not long ago, in December here, I was in Kansas City, and in a very nice Hilton hotel, they were very proud, they had all new floors. I walked down the hallway to show them to my room, just walking in the hallway, brand new carpet, they hadn't even removed the threads and the bits and pieces, that was just laid the same day. And I didn't even get to my room. I was already choking and coughing from these chemicals, from the new carpeting. Don't put new carpeting in the house. If you have new carpeting, you cannot recover. Tear it out. Have uh, uh, floor coverings like uh, perhaps some uh, cotton area rugs that are washable or something like that. You cannot get well with new carpeting. It's highly toxic. That's not all. One of the worst toxic substances in the home is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is found in glues, is found in uh, um, plywood. Any wood gluing that you do, if you are puttering with wood and are gluing things, don't use the glues and the aesthetics. They are all very toxic. The formaldehyde is a carcinogen. It is highly toxic. Also very toxic are uh, textile chemicals. When I walk into a, I walk into a, uh, uh, a store, especially the department stores, where there are a lot of clothes around, I've got to get out of there in 20 minutes. I choke. It dries my throat. It dries my breath. I can't breathe. I choke. I've got to go outside to breathe. Okay, but most people, they are so toxic, they don't notice it. They can't even tell the difference. So for, uh, the, the formaldehyde and textile chemicals, try to wear either silk or cotton clothes because the artificial clothing is not good for you, okay? But still worse, uh, some of the paints, fresh paints in the house, uh, bugs, insecticides, pesticides. If your house has had uh, termites and has had termite treatment three months ago, it's still in your carpeting, in your upholstery, it's in your walls, it's all over. You can't recover in a house like that. It's very dangerous, yes. What is the chemical in what? New carpets. What is the chemical in new carpets? I have the slightest idea. I don't know what it is. But I know it's highly toxic and it's very, very dangerous to live in it. We had a young lady who was pregnant. And because she was going to have a baby, they were moving into a new apartment, they wanted everything nice and new, they put new carpeting in the new apartment. From that day on, Everything came up. She couldn't eat or drink a thing. She vomited. Every, she almost died. She came to our hospital the first day. She was eating and drinking, no problem. They had to rip out the carpet and put the old one back in. It smells. As long as you smell it, it's poison. The new carpeting is extremely dangerous. Don't buy new carpeting. When you have a sick patient and you want to recover, you cannot recover with new carpeting in the house, okay? Very little. It doesn't outgas that fast. How long does it take? Can you wash it? Probably three to six months. Can you wash it unlikely? Doesn't take it all out, okay? How is the best way to have your carpets clean? Shampooed. Not with chemicals, with soap and water. <coughs> okay? Okay. Now, uh, another problem is the swimming pool. I already mentioned, you cannot swim in chlorinated water. You cannot go into saunas and so on that have a lot of chlorine. And one of my pet peeves, cosmetics. It's not only if you put on a whole lot of stuff on your skin, you not only block the pores, you absorb stuff. You put on lipstick, you eat it, it goes into the body. Don't do that. When you are sick and when you're doing the therapy and when you have to recover, you must not use these chemicals. But by far the worst 
not just the, uh, to put on the skin, you know, various ointments and creams, they block the pores, they absorb into the body. When you eat right and drink right, my skin is smooth and natural and normal. You'll notice I have no liver spots. I use no creams and ointments. It's soft as a baby's. I don't need anything because from within the body is healed. Just a minute. Um, so your skin is going to heal and be natural and normal and thin and healthy and no problem, okay? But of all the things that you do, the, I think the absolute worst is underarm deodorants and antiperspirants, okay? Now, you've got to first understand why that is so bad. <clears throat> the body has a whole number of systems that help detoxify. We talked about that a lot. The liver and the intestinal tract detoxifies a lot. Uh, the kidneys detoxify very intensively. But when none of these systems work very well, the body also has another system, the perspiration, the glands. And some people that are ill and toxic, they have night sweats. What happens? When you rest, another system takes over and detoxes and you get rid of a whole lot of toxic substances in the sweating, okay? Now, when that happens, a lot of people say, oh, I smell, and I'm not socially acceptable. I have to stop this perspiration. Hey, wait a minute. If you smell, then your body is getting rid of highly toxic, damaging substances. And instead of stopping it, blocking your uh, perspiration, your ducts, your glands and your ducts, and forcing the chemicals back into your lymph system and the breast, let them out. So how do you get rid of the smell? How do you get rid of these toxins? First of all, you don't put any toxins into your body. You eat organic vegetarian food without poisons, without toxins. Secondly, would you believe that the best way to get rid of the night sweats and the smelly perspiration is a coffee enema? Help your body detoxify the right way through the kidneys and the liver, through the coffee enemas and the juices. And I assure you, you will have no unpleasant smell and you don't have to block the perspiration. Now, when you normally perspire, like it's too hot, or it's a hot day, or it's summer, or you do heavy work, okay, you're going to perspire. I assure you, your perspiration is not going to be smelly. Now, I don't want to take any responsibility. If you're not going to wash for six months, you're going to smell. But if you normally keep clean, and your body normally is clean inside, you're not going to have smelly perspiration. And for heaven's sakes, don't use any sticks, any minerals, any sprays, any uh, blockers of any kind. Put nothing under your arm except soap and water. Wash. Because if you block this perspiration and force the chemicals back into your lymph system, I have a feeling that some, there may be something there that helps to cause breast cancer. Another thing is very important. Uh, I understand that breast cancer in men is rapidly increasing. And I have a strong suspicion that underarm deodorants have something to do with it. So please be very careful with cosmetics, creams, ointments, lipstick, anything at all. Now we let you use a little eye pencil if you must. But otherwise, also please don't use nail polish. It blocks the respiration within the nails. It gives me acute pain. It feels like something is putting on a nail, a, a screw, and tightening it. Okay? I can't handle it. The lady asked, don't they have non-toxic cosmetics in health food stores? Yes, they call it non-allergenic or something like that. But what is it? Like lipstick. Right? Now, what is in lipstick? Wax, dyes, solvents, perfumes. You want to eat that? Would you take a lipstick and take a bite and eat it? But you're eating it goes on your lips and eventually it disappears. Well, how come? Because you wipe your lips and you eat it. You don't want to eat that. No matter how they call it non-allergenic, it is not 
there because it blocks your pores, it goes into your body, it blocks your underarm perspiration, and it is dangerous. And if you are ill, and if you're on the Gerson therapy, if you want to get well, you're not going to use it. Including, of course, fluoridated toothpaste and hair bleaches and even permanence, Dr. Gerson forbade. Okay? And I know for rubbing alcohol under the arms. You can use what Dr. Gerson describes in the back of the book, something like an alcohol, water, and vinegar e in equal parts, a rub to rub on the skin. And you can rub that a little bit on you, yes. But I tell you again, you don't need it. If your body is normally healthy, inside and out, clean, cleansed, you don't need it. A normal washing once a day, and if you are perspiring because of hard work or so, hot weather, an extra wash, and you will not have any problem. Okay? All right. You brush your teeth, essentially, with a brush. If you must use a little toothpaste, be sure it's not fluoridated. There are some toms and shifts, I think, put out some, but you've got to be careful because they want to help you out, and they, because there's so much demand for fluoridated toothpaste, they put out both, fluoridated and none. Be sure you don't use fluoridated toothpaste. And if you use any toothpaste at all, use only a tiny bit, you don't need it. It's for just cosmetic purposes, for a little flavor. And the flavor is sugar and, and, and chemicals, and you want to try to avoid that. Okay? All right. I also would like to talk quickly about ozone. Ozone is extremely valuable. Ozone has an extra O, which is a very active element, and the extra O, the active oxygen of the O, is uh, helps tumor tissue. It helps destroy tumor tissue. It helps uh, oxygenate the body. It is extremely valuable, ozone. We use it rectally. It's absorbed into the body, and it raises oxygen levels in the blood and helps kill tumor tissue. You can also use hydrogen peroxide if you know what you're doing and you use it correctly. The hydrogen peroxide that you buy in, uh, in uh, pharmacies uh, has uh, a 3%, is a 3% solution, but it has, uh, in addition, uh, certain stabilizing agents which are not good, so you cannot use it internally. But the 3% solution you can rub into your skin, and it is very valuable, it's very helpful. Okay, but if you're going to use it internally, you, you have to have the clean, uh, n uh, the food grade material. And you have to use it correctly because it comes uh, somewhere between 12 and 36, 35 percent, and that is dangerous. You've got to know how to use it. For internal use, not more than half percent. And most people don't know how to reduce something that's 12 percent to half a percent. Anybody? Well, I just get out my calculator and do it. Now, how do you uh, reduce uh, something that's 12 percent to half a percent? 24, the one in 24, no? Simple. Oh, no calculator. It's quite easy. If it happens to be 35 percent and one to half percent, now what do you do? 70. I'm glad you can figure it out. Okay. How about that for teeth? You can very well brush your teeth with half percent solution, but do it right and know you get half percent and no higher, because if it's higher, you're going to hurt yourself. You have to have the food grade? Should be for internal, you should have the food grade. And if you have a cold, for instance, or a sore throat, you can gargle with it as long as it's half percent and you do it right. And if you do anything stronger, you can kill yourself, so please be careful. Soda for brushing teeth. What soda? What is it? I think it's uh, sodium. Baking soda. Poison. All sodium is poison. Baking soda, eating salt, poison. Baking soda is salt? It's sodium bicarbonate. It's sodium. It's poison, yes. All sodium is poison. 
Yes. Why, why, why do they give that fluoride for toothpaste? Why do they give you fluoride for toothpaste? It's a more heavy poison. Why do they give you chemotherapy? It's still heavier poison. You know what chemotherapy is made of? It's based on mustard gas that they killed the soldiers with in World War I. That's good for you, right? It's healthy when you have cancer already. That's really good. Right? Yeah. They don't tell you that. So anything in the medical armamentarium, any medical drug, they all are liver toxic, no exception. They don't heal anything. They suppress symptoms. Is there any toothpaste that's any good? I told you, there is. Tom's makes some and Schiff's makes some without fluoride. Make sure you get the non-fluoride. It's still not good because I said it has few other things in it, including some sugar sometimes and some flavors, none of which are very good. If you use any, use a tiny bit. It's better to use hydrogen peroxide as long as you know what you're doing and use it at the proper dilution. Yes. For the last 10 years, I've been using a toothpaste that's made by the Shackley Corporation. There's no fluoride in it, no, uh, no additives that you not want. That's Probably okay. Okay. This lady had a question. How do you get out the ozone? How do you get out the seven of the ozone? We're only talking about the peroxide, which is also ozone. You see, the ozone is O3, which is oxygen plus one oxygen, one O. Oxygen O2 plus one O. The hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, which is H2O, water plus one oxygen. In either case, you're getting the one oxygen radical, which is the active ingredient. So ozone and peroxide essentially have the same function. They're slightly different material, but the idea is the same. All right? So ozone and peroxide, but you can't easily get ozone. So peroxide is your alternative. That's quite easy to come by. You can buy some, not just in a drugstore. You can buy some 12%. At, at our hospital, you can buy the 35%, which is dangerous unless properly diluted. Half percent for internal use. Three percent for external use. Very important, I want to make sure that you understand that the Gerson therapy is not in favor of fasting. Since all chronic degenerative disease is based on deficiency and toxicity, deficiency is worsened by fasting. You do nothing for the body when you're fasting. You may help some in detoxifying. Unless you take coffee enemas, a lot of the people that do the fasting on you don't allow you or suggest that you take enemas so that you release toxins and they give you awful headaches because you get poisoning in your system. It's released and it's not eliminated. In some cases, it can cause you worse trouble. Never, never fast, okay? That doesn't mean stuff yourself with steak and shrimps and, 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 and uh, uh, lobster, okay? You must eat the right foods. But fasting is a bad mistake. While with the Gerson therapy, you get only healing foods. You get a lot of it. But it helps additionally in detoxifying you. But you need also to do the coffee enemas. So it absolutely is not a good idea to do fasting. Now, fasting is better than overeating, okay? But fasting does not heal chronic disease. It aggravates it because it increases the deficiency. Now, I have, for instance, a man who told me, oh, yes, but he had a daughter and she had schizophrenia, and he fasted her for 30 days and she was perfectly normal. I said, yes, and then what happened when she started to eat again? Well, it all came back. True. Well, I explained to you, schizophrenia is caused and based on excess protein that these sick people cannot digest to the end product, so the intermediate product is causing the problem in the brain. So you cut out all food, you don't have any problem, but then you eat again, you eat the wrong things, and you're right back where you started from. You can't fast forever. 
So it's a question of eating the right foods. And fasting is not the answer. It does, it does not heal because it does not rebuild the organ systems, OK? Now, another, uh, another very important point that I need to make is stress, all right? Stress. Now, a lot of people are told that stress causes disease. A lot of people are told that stress causes cancer. You know that? Do you, have you heard that? OK. That it causes heart attacks and all kinds of things, OK? Now, let me explain. There's absolutely no doubt that stress changes body chemistry. Stress causes adrenaline to be released. The adrenaline causes changes in the body chemistry, OK? But a normal, healthy liver neutralizes these adrenaline substances and the toxic substances, gets rid of the waste, the toxins, and you are good as new, provided your liver works normally. In other words, you're healthy. Stress cannot harm you if you are otherwise healthy. On the other hand, if stress products accumulate in your body, yes, indeed, then they cause trouble because they're toxins. OK? Now, they tell you, for instance, that with stress, you reduce the immune system. Absolutely. During a time of stress, your immune system is lowered because there are toxins in the system. But as your healthy liver gets rid of them, you are well again, and your immune system takes over and gets rid of any damage, and that's the end of it. Now, if stress does damage, that means your liver isn't doing the job of detoxifying. You, it means you are already ill. And on top of it, the stress now causes additional damage. That is true. But I absolutely refuse to admit that stress by itself causes cancer or any other disease. For instance, out in nature, don't tell me that there's a single animal that's not under constant stress. Take a sparrow. I've traveled in a lot of places. I've never found any place that doesn't have sparrows, OK? Take a sparrow. Now, the sparrow scratches in the soil, and he finds a worm. Right away, there's three on top of him trying to get it away. Back around the bush sits a cat waiting to pounce on him, trying to eat him. Up in the sky is a hawk helping, waiting to pounce on him and eat him. Back home in his little nest, there are three or four little hungry ones that are waiting for that worm. Now, that's not stress. How come animals survive? Because they have live, healthy food, and they are well. And they survive the stress, daily stress of living and of fighting for their lives and for their little ones. Daily stress of actual danger of death all the time. OK? Now, another little interesting point. Only a short time ago, we had some of our hostages coming back from Lebanon, right? Now, the, some of them were there four or five years, and a couple of them were there six, seven years under stressful conditions, would you say? Right? They're often blindfolded. They were in dark rooms. They were chained to balconies in the winter when it was cold. They were, how come they didn't get cancer? Five, six, seven years of stress of that type, how come they didn't get cancer? You know why? They didn't get much to eat. They did not overload their bodies with protein and fat. Therefore, the immune system worked, and they survived. It's not the stress that causes the cancer. It's sometimes, though, what you do on account of stress. Because of stress, let's say, in business, you drink more coffee. You work harder evenings, you stay awake, you drink more coffee. And you are not able to go home and have a proper meal, so you get some fast food from the neighborhood uh, uh, McDonald's. OK? All right? And, and maybe then in the evening to unwind, you have a couple of extra drinks that you might not have. You smoke more, and so on. That can cause disease. 
It's what you do on account of stress that can cause disease. Okay? But stress by itself does not cause disease. Not if you have a functioning liver that neutralizes and detoxifies after stress is over, and that's the end of it. Okay? So please do not let doctors tell you that stress causes disease because it leaves them off the hook. They are fat, and it's wonderfully easy to blame the victim. You, it's your fault. And then they tell you stress causes disease, and by telling you so, they cause you extra stress. So they are partly cause of disease, and they are. OK? That's not the answer. Stress alone does not cause disease. OK, the another reason why I feel so strongly about it is, first of all, because when you're told you are sick because you have stress, well, what can I do? How can I get away from stress? What am I going to do? That alone is stress. The next thing is, we had a patient, for instance. She originally had cancer in her lacrimal gland in the eye. And it invaded the whole globe of the eye. They had her eye removed. And when they did, they found that it had just started to travel along the optic nerve into the brain. So they gave her a lot of radiation. OK? And the radiation maybe stopped it in the brain, but next thing, in a few months, she had it all through her lungs. And she said, no, I can't. You gave me radiation that got rid of all the rest of the cells. It can't be. I want another biopsy. She had another biopsy done of her lungs, and of course, it was cancer. Meantime, she has a husband who says, I'll do whatever you want. She has two young children, six and nine years of age. And there's a lot of stress around. Totally unsupported family. OK? She does the Gerson therapy. And she gets well. Well, if the stress caused her the disease, the disease, the stress remained. She stayed with the same husband. She had the same stress at home. But she got well. How come? It was not the stress. We were able now to get her liver to function, and the stress products were eliminated. And she survived and got well. OK? so. I want to very clearly point out that stress alone does not cause cancer. You ought to first have a damaged liver. Well, of course, with a damaged liver, you're going to have disease. Stress is just one of the additional factors on top of your poor food and your poor eating habits and your living habits, etc., etc. OK? Question? What about alcohol? The question is, can we have a glass of wine? No. Alcohol is a toxin. Why do some people get drunk from alcohol, even wine? Why do they get drunk? What is drunkenness? It's liver toxic. Your brain doesn't get the oxygen. Your brain gets the alcohol, and it gets poisoned, right? Because you're not yourself. Your, your brain cells are poisoned, right? And with it, your liver cells get poisoned. Alcohol has to be oxidized up into sugar. And for that, you need enzymes. So your liver gets depleted of enzymes. And the morning after, what's that? Poison, because of the enzyme damage. Poison, right? You don't feel good the morning after, right? I don't know if you've ever had one. I haven't, so I don't know. But I've read and heard enough about it. OK. Now, that is liver damage. Alcohol produces liver damage because it requires of the liver enzymes. It depletes the liver of enzymes to even oxidize it up so the body can get rid of it. It leaves poisons and toxins in your body. So can that help you to get well? No way. Alcohol is completely out forbidden. Of course, smoking and all those things, too. By the way, we have a lot of problem with drugs particularly street drugs. Doctors who prescribe drugs are not good either. But street drugs are somewhat worse. Because street drugs are essentially mood-changing drugs. And the mood-changing drugs of the medical profession are just as bad. That includes the Valium and the Librium, and particularly also the antidepressive drugs. They are terribly damaging and very dangerous and very difficult to overcome. Imipramine and that kind of stuff. Very, very bad. 
But now let's look at drug damage and addiction. Of course, we get a whole bunch of people who are smokers, some that are alcoholics. And we have had, of course, a number of patients who are, because of cancer pain, are already on morphine and are into morphine addiction. All right? Now, we also have seen drug addicts. We have seen several patients heroin addicted, and we have seen at least one who had a very severe cocaine addiction. Now, cocaine is supposed to be impossible to overcome. You just can't overcome it, can't get rid of it. Okay? This young man with a cocaine habit told us that he was 33. He said all his friends were dead. And he said he was dying. He could feel his lungs giving out, his nose and so on, sniffing this stuff. But his lungs were giving out. And he said, if you can't help me in two, three months, I'll be dead like my friends. He was also a heavy smoker, cigarettes besides. So we started him on the therapy. Now the therapy does something very interesting to addicts. Largely addiction is a problem of deficiency, and the body craves something. After a while it craves drugs, but essentially it's craving. And what's the body truly craving is nutrients. Now we give these addicts every hour a glass of fresh juice loaded with nutrients, enzymes, minerals, vitamins. First thing that goes, their craving disappears. Their craving goes. Whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, whether it's uh, cocaine, heroin, makes no difference. Their craving disappears. But as you stop taking in the poisons, now the body starts to release the poisons, and you call that what? In drug addicts? Withdrawal symptoms. You call it cold turkey. I don't care what you call it. It's the same thing. The body now releases some of the toxins. They're very, very sick. They have the tremors. They have perspiration. They have cramps and spasms. So when the body releases toxins with the Gerson therapy, what do you do? Coffee enemas. The coffee enemas do the trick. And within two days, we have these heavy addicts off of the drug, clear of uh, cravings, and clear of the uh, withdrawal symptoms. We have only one problem that lasts a little bit longer. They have bad dreams at night. Why? At night, they go to sleep. They don't get a glass of juice every hour anymore. They don't get the regular enemas. So they wake up highly toxic after three, four hours. In the middle of the night, they take another enema, they go back to sleep. Okay. It's so easy to overcome drug addiction. Can you imagine what we could do for the entire United States and this whole drug culture, which also causes the increase, a tremendous increase in crime? Can all be eliminated so easy? We can't take AIDS patients. That's a different story. Let's stay with the drug addiction for another minute. Because it's too important to pass it up. The basic problem with drugs, in my estimation, is children who are deficient. Children who, because they get the wrong food, are lacking in energy. Now, there's a wonderful photomicrograph. I don't have that book here right now. Uh, of what happens to the red blood cells when you eat a fat meal. Under the dark microscope, dark field microscope, you can see red blood cells floating around free on, in the microscope field. And of course, when they float around free, they pick up oxygen and they carry it through the bloodstream, through the tiny capillaries, and they have to fold over to even get through. They're tiny as they are, the red blood cells. They have to fold over to get through the capillaries to deliver the oxygen to all the cells all over your body, billions of them. 
Now what happens when you ingest a fat meal, any fat, whether it's breakfast with bacon or eggs, whether it's lunch with a hamburger or a frankfurter, whether it's dinner with a piece of fish or a piece of cheese, makes no difference. Any fat meal, butter, milk, the red blood cells that are supposed to float free start to form rulers. They sit on top of each other like rolls of pennies. They uh, agglutinate, they glue, they stick together. Now you know very well then their surface is reduced. And not only that, they can't pick up as much oxygen, but they are now bunches, clumps, and they can't get through the tiny capillaries. They can't fold over. They can't deliver their oxygen. What happens? After a fat meal, you're tired. Your brain isn't getting much oxygen. Not enough. You're tired. Okay. What happens to the kids? Lunch, a hamburger, frankfurter, or a, 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 a roll or something with luncheon meat that's highly fat or cheese. Okay, now they're tired but they want to do sports, they want to be active, they want to win, they want to play, and they're tired. They want something to give them pep and energy. And you know what? They're going to find it. Well, what do they find? First thing they find is Coca-Cola. It's caffeine, it's a stimulant, it's sugar. Gives them pep, okay? And pretty soon they find cigarettes. Gives them a pep, it gives them a rise, gives them a stimulant. And then still a little bit later, they drink alcohol. They get an energy, they, and then they find the street drugs. Somebody says, hey, this will give you a lift. And they find the street drugs, and they call it with a terrible name. They call it recreational drugs. Recreation by eye. It's life-threatening. It's not recreation, it's dangerous, okay? But now, the basic problem is deficiency. It's a lack of oxygenation. It's the wrong food. It's the fat food they eat. And the inability of the body to produce energy because the oxygen is blocked from these rulos that are now the red blood cells. It can't be done. The answer, we can completely eliminate the drug culture with the right food for the kids. The fresh food, the fresh carrot juice, the fresh apples and carrots, fresh salads, fresh vegetables. And if they eat a sandwich, it has to be whole grain bread, and it has to have uh, non-fat cottage cheese with uh, tomatoes or radishes instead of a Frankfurt or a hamburger. And when they eat desserts, they have to have fruit or fruit uh, uh, compote or something like that, not ice cream, more fat. And if we want healthy children, it's the only way to do it. And then we can prevent their getting into drugs. And the whole drug culture can be wiped out. But it takes knowledge, understanding. The whole biochemistry of the body has to be properly dealt with. And if they're already addicts, we can deal with that too, quite easily. Imagine what we could do if this could be accepted if it could be understood and accepted, and if we could set up clinics to do this. But there are laws against it. You're not allowed to heal. There's too much money to be made on drugs. It's a very terrible thing. So are there any problems or questions about drugs and addiction or stress? How about marijuana? What about it? How dangerous is it? It has some 52 toxic fractions. All drugs are dangerous, some a little more, some a little less. Marijuana is not safe, as they will help you think. And marijuana is now even used by orthodox medicine to counteract the symptoms of nausea after chemotherapy, right? Great stuff. Okay. Other questions? All right. <clears throat> then we go into another subject. Uh, other cancer therapies. <clears throat> I already touched on Laetrile. There's nothing wrong with Laetrile. Laetrile is non-toxic. Yes, it does contain a little 
cyanide. But you got to what? No, wait a minute. What about vitamin B12? What's the full name, the full medical name for vitamin B12? And they inject it into you, don't they? It's called cyanocobalamin. Does it have cyanide in it? Yes. Not any more or any less than laetrile. <clears throat> but this cyanide fraction in laetrile happens to work very well against tumor tissue. The cyanide helps to attack tumor tissue. You have cyanide in your body. Every body cavity has a bacteriostat. It's perfectly good in tiny, tiny quantities, okay? But in cancer, it helps attack tumor tissue because why not healthy tissue? Healthy tissue has a certain enzyme called rhodonase. That enzyme neutralizes the cyanide. No harm comes to healthy cells. But the cancer cells don't have that rhodonase. And therefore, they're subject to attack by the cyanide, which is good. But <clears throat> later, while well, we can use it and it's good, it doesn't restore the body. It doesn't heal the liver and the essential organ. It doesn't bring back the immune system. It doesn't detoxify. It doesn't do any of those things. And therefore, they tell you once you're laetrile, you have to be on it for the rest of your life or the tumors come back. Yes, of course, because you've done nothing to help the body fight the cancer. And usually, after a while, your body systems are weaker and more damaged as, of, as you go, and the laetrile doesn't work anymore. So it's not good enough. We use it as a tool, as an additional tool, but it does not heal. And unless you restore the body, Totally, your cancer will come back. That is not the answer. <clears throat> I've already talked about ozone. Ozone is also very good, very helpful. Ozone also helps to attack tumor tissue and germs and viruses, a good antibiotic. And ozone is not a cure either for the same reason. Ozone does not restore minerals and hormones and enzymes to your body systems. It does not heal the liver. It does not reduce the toxic damage in the body. You still have to do the basic nutrition. If you insist on eating terrible foods and junk, the, all the ozone in the world and all the laetrile in the world isn't going to help you. It doesn't go. You need the nutrients to rebuild and restore the body. You need the enzymes to re reactivate. You need to restore the immune system if you want to heal, okay? There are still other therapies, too. Very interesting, for instance, Burton, the immuno-augmentative therapy, okay? Now, one time I was on the same platform with Burton uh, for Gary Null in New York. You may know of him. He is a very well-known speaker. He's a very well-known nutritionist. He also is on the inf infomercials now, uh, also uh, demonstrating uh, a juicer. Very nice. He does all kinds of good work. He had several of our sp the speakers together, <coughs> and I was the first speaker on the podium, and I showed three or four recovered cancer patients, of which one advanced melanoma who had melanoma all over his, uh, his neck and his body and internally, and five and a half years later, in total good health, completely recovered. The other patient was one of my father's from the book, case number 35, whose tumor had gone from the skin, through the scalp, into the skull, through into the brain, and, and he was dying with this cancer in the brain. And here he is, 35, 40 years later, totally well, completely clear, no cancer, nothing. And the third patient was a girl. She was only 36 or 7 years old. When she was 7, she was my father's patient for osteosarcoma, given up to die. She is alive and well with her leg intact. They were going to cut her leg off, not to save her life, but to spare her unbearable pain while she was dying. The parents refused. She is completely recovered. I had these people in person on stage showing total recoveries between five and a half 
and 40 years. Next comes burden. First statement he makes is you can't cure cancer, it'll always be there. <laughs> the next thing, he shows two patients. One was his wife. His wife had had ovarian cancer for about seven years, and he had kept her more or less in balance, functioning. And she was alive. Okay, meantime, she's died. The other patient he showed was a man with prostate cancer. And he had prostate cancer and bone metastases, and he was keeping him alive and the metastases under control. But he said he still had the cancer, he still had the metastases a year and a half later. And he was living in the Bahamas because he had to have a treatment daily of some shot or some injection. Our patients go home after two or three weeks and carry on at home and recover. The man was not recovered. He still had his cancer after a year and a half, having to sit in the Bahamas. Okay, that's not a cure. Fine, if he can keep the immune system going to a certain degree, great. I have nothing against it. But it doesn't cure. We're talking about healing the body so it functions normally on its own. What about growth hormone shots? What about growth hormone shots? Yeah. What about growth hormone? You want to grow more tumors? What do you want to grow? What are you talking about? I think what you mean is live cell therapy. Is that what you mean? I agree with that too, but uh, on, on that, there was an article on, on Kelvin at the, uh, at the uh, time, they talked about he was giving, he was giving people a growth hormone. Oh, arginine. Arginine is not a growth hormone, it's an amino acid. Well, growth hormone is a growth hormone. It's a amino acid. Growth hormone is highly dangerous. Okay. L-arginine is an amino acid. Right. Amino acid, I, I know. He was giving them amino acid. He had some good results. I never argue with results. He had some good results. But I also saw a lot of his failures. Yes, I did. Yeah. I didn't understand those shots, though. Uh, they are uh, amino acids. I feel, and it has generally been shown, that L-arginine is an immune depressant. I don't know just how he does it. Okay, but he also fasts people. That's not a good idea. Not a good idea. All right. I have a sister who was heavily into smoking and uh, did not wish to give it up. If she were to come to a clinic like yours, how, what is the usual time? Well, we gave her two options. Either she stops smoking within 24 hours or she leaves and goes home. The reason is this. When a patient smokes, that is so highly liver toxic, it's so toxic to the whole system. It causes such deep damage. There's no way we can help, okay? Also, if we now do a partial therapy because of the smoking, we have no control, and we don't know what's going to happen, and we, we don't know, therefore, we can't take responsibility. She cannot stay under those conditions. Unless she wishes to get well and stop smoking, we, cannot, we wouldn't even accept her. If she tells us, she wouldn't stop. But if she comes and smokes, we request that she please leave. We cannot keep such patients. We can't be responsible for them. So what do you do for your smoking process at your clinic? Well, first of all, we can almost totally relieve her of withdrawal problems, so she won't have any problem. The second thing is we can overcome whatever is ill, whatever illness she may have. I don't know if you're going to tell me if she has any other problems besides smoking. We can probably overcome those problems, whatever they may be. Okay? But there's something else that I'd like to point out in regard to smoking. We can help people considerably just by giving them niacin. What is niacin? The full name is nicotinic acid. Nicotinic acid is to nicotine as carbon dioxide is to carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is highly toxic. Carbon dioxide, you, you, you breathe all day long. The same with nicotine. It's highly toxic. Nicotinic acid is vitamin B3. Now, nicotine opens up, forces open capillaries as a toxin. But a toxin, with any action, has a reaction, and it spasms after it wears off. Niacin opens up capillaries gently. It's a vitamin. And it gives you almost the same lift as a cigarette would. 
Therefore, when we have these patients giving them juice to stop their craving, and we give them the niacin to open the capillaries, which would otherwise happen with the nicotine, we can get them off smoking very easily without withdrawal problems. And they don't have any trouble. And now we can deal with them. We had one lady, case in point, who came to us, oh, this is probably 10 years ago. She was a heavy smoker. And as a heavy smoker, she had um, the lung problem. What's it called again? Um, emphysema, thank you. Just slipped my mind. She had emphysema very severely. And after a while on emphysema, she wouldn't stop smoking. She started to get lung cancer. And the lung cancer became more serious. And she started to have a collapsed lung. And she wouldn't stop smoking. She was thin as a reed. She had smoked 40 years. She was smoking up to three and a half packs a day. Finally, finally, she realized if she didn't stop smoking and do something, she would die. She came to us, still nervously puffing at her last cigarette as she was driving into the clinic, right? We had her there 24 hours. She calls her son. She says, I can't believe it, I'm not smoking. And I don't have any problem. She was drinking the juices, she was getting potassium, she was getting the enemas, she was getting the niacin, and she was, she said, I can't believe it. All this time, I couldn't stop in one day. We got her off it without any real problem. She said, I hardly notice it. Okay? I really don't know what finally happened to her. I don't know. Thank you. How much niacin would you recommend for someone who doesn't have any other problems but I don't recommend I don't prescribe. Uh, niacin happens to be a completely harmless material. Uh, my father gave niacin, for instance, to people who had allergies, including asthma and hay fever. And when you give asthma uh, or allergy patients and hay fever patients uh, niacin, they get relief of their symptom. And you can take 20 a day of 50 milligrams. And this is one kind of uh, vitamin. It's a water-soluble vitamin, where if you take a tremendous overdose, the body gets rid of it, no problem. It's a little bit similar to vitamin C that way. But otherwise, if you have no special problems, if you take maybe a couple of hundred mi milligrams, I don't think there's any problem. There's no, no real overdosing difficulty. OK? All right? How about a secondary smoke? It's bad. It's just as bad, well, almost as bad as primary smoking. But there again, since in many cases you can't control secondary smoke inhalation, you have to detoxify the body. Now you drink juices and you take one or two coffee enemas a day and get rid of the poison so that it doesn't eventually harm you and cause your illness. Of course, secondary smoking is a very bad business. All right? Are there any other questions? All right. <coughs> Yes. Do you recommend slow release? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. Do we recommend slow release niacin? Slow release anything is useless and is absolutely a gimmick. It doesn't work. Let me tell you, we had a case, a man who had colon cancer quite severe. It was very close to being obstructed. And he had pain, so we gave him Dr. Gerson's pain medication, which is aspirin, niacin, and vitamin C. The niacin that the doctor had on hand, no, I'm sorry, the vitamin C the doctor had on hand happened to be slow-release vitamin C. So we gave him that. Nevertheless, within a couple of days, he was obstructed. And he had to have surgery. It was an emergency. When they opened him up in his colon, they found a couple, three days after he took it, the slow release still in its original pearl, not released, complete just the way it was. It doesn't get dissolved. It's a gimmick. It's garbage. It's nonsense. Don't do it. And somebody makes money on it, and you're not getting this stuff. I read an article that time release nice and has actually killed people. Time and ladies, niacin has killed people. I don't believe that either. I don't believe that because there is no way that niacin can kill you. 
I just mentioned that in certain cases, certain situations with allergies such as hay fever and asthma, Dr. Gerson gave large, large amounts. Nobody ever had any problem with it. Never time release, but time release, if it all it is, is niacin, it's not a problem. The problem is the actual material they coat it with. That can be damaging, that could be possible, but it's not the niacin. It's the time release material. I have no idea what they use, but, but it's just a bad idea altogether. Does it thin your blood? Does niacin thin your blood? No way. However, there's something else that we need to watch for niacin. As far as niacin is concerned, it never causes bleeding, but if there is bleeding in the body, since niacin keeps the capillaries open, it will tend to keep the bleeding going. So if there is bleeding any part in the body, we cannot and do not give niacin. That includes during the female period, we have to stop niacin for four or five days until all bleeding stops, then it can be given again. It will never cause bleeding, but it will cause that existing bleeding to continue, and it won't, uh, uh, you know, the blood will not coagulate as easily, okay? On the other hand, Dr. Gerson also talked, for instance, about um, bleeders, uh, people who had, uh, what was it? Hemophilia. Hemophilia, thank you. Name just escaped. <clears throat> that too could be cleared with the Gerson therapy. And another case in the book that Dr. Gerson talks about, case number four, was a brain tumor. At the end of about a year and a half, when the tumor was gone and the cancer was cleared, the same patient also had, he was Wasserman plus four positive, in other words, he had syphilis. At the end of the treatment, when the cancer was gone, he was negative, so was the syphilis gone, without any special antiluetic, anti-syphilitic treatment. Okay, now I had a question earlier about AIDS. We have a special problem in Mexico as far as AIDS is concerned. The uh, health authorities refuse to allow us to take AIDS patients. They will not allow AIDS patients into Mexico. They don't want to be known as an AIDS haven. They also have a special problem. You know, they are quite strictly Catholic. They have a special problem with uh, <coughs> homosexuals and they don't want anything to do with it, okay? So because we can't take such patients, we have no experience with them. But as I just explained, since we are able with the Gerson therapy to overcome syphilis, since we are able to reactivate the immune system, which is the problem with AIDS, since we can use ozone, which has been proven very effective with AIDS, the chances are very high that our results with AIDS would be excellent. There have been two patients who came as outpatients on, with AIDS and who responded extremely well. But I don't want to judge from two patients and tell you, yes, we can help AIDS, okay? It's not enough of a sample. So I, don't, I want to be honest and tell you that's all we can say. A couple of patients have responded well. And we are able in most other patients to activate and restore the immune system. Therefore, we can assume that AIDS could be totally curable also with the Gerson therapy. Yes? How about ozone? What is ozone? Ozone is O3. Oxygen is O2. Ozone is O3. It has an extra oxygen radical attached. O, uh, the O2 oxygen has a double bond. So the two oxygen molecules are connected with a double chemical bond which makes them a fairly stable compound. The extra O is attached with a single bond, which makes this a very active molecule, or rather, uh, you know, material. So O1 is very active and is very uh, uh, helpful in these many conditions. Okay? Now one more question, one more minute, and we have to close. Is this the same O 
Yellowstone that you speak of or you hear spoken about in the stratosphere? Excellent question. Is it the same oxygen or ozone as in the stratosphere? And is it the same ozone as people talk about in, uh, in smog? Absolutely. Whatever you see in the atmosphere that's blue is ozone. And it's extremely important because when we lose the ozone layer, we lose the protection from excess sun radiation, right? The same ozone also connects with the toxic fractions which produce smog. But they blame ozone because they don't want to say it's car exhaust and it's the chemicals they produce. They want to blame it on something else, so they blame the ozone. The ozone is actually coming in to neutralize and attach to these uh, highly toxic fractions and attempts to make them less toxic. But uh, the, the ozone is involved, yes, absolutely. But the ozone is a very beneficial material. And it also is a, um, uh, in the body, it's, uh, it helps to attach to uh, free radicals. It's a free radical scavenger. It helps to attach to free radicals and neutralize them, the same as it neutralizes uh, smog and uh, exhaust fumes and so on. It's a very, very helpful material. I'd like to thank everybody, and I'd like you to keep in mind that, first of all, nobody needs to be ill, nobody needs to have disease, nobody has to die of these chronic diseases, but more important, we can prevent it, we can have healthy children, we can be healthy and have a normal, healthy life for long, productive living. And I'd like you to keep this in mind and the Gerson therapy and the right nutrients and nutrition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.